Um, hi, I'm uh, Carissa Britton. I work in uh, Philadelphia mostly with GIS data. Um, I guess just go get started. Um, so we had a problem. Uh, we had a very, very large set of data uh, running on the, on the edge of like 100 and 170, 180 gigs of data per day. Um, and uh, we had a, a single, very poorly written Python script that was supposed to be uh, resolving all of this data and putting it in a database. Um, the, the main issue, the, the equation here, is that it was taking 26 hours to run 24 hours of data, um, which everybody knows is not a way to keep anything up to date. Um, and I don't know why they left it for so long. This is kind of a slowly getting worse type of scenario, and then they suddenly realized, hey, we have somebody in the company who knows Python now. Maybe they should take a look at it. Um, so here is a, a little bit about the, the very large data sets that we're working with. Um, uh, wind and hail and lightning. Uh, wind was really the big issue here. Um, it's point-based data coming out of all 176 um, weather stations that NOAA pulls data from. Um, and it's based on radar velocities, and so it really only has like two or three values in it, so the individual files were not huge, but we got this huge entire data set once every six minutes. Um, so it kind of got really, really big. Um, a single six-minute file looks something like this for a slightly blustery day. Um, you can imagine Hurricane Sandy looked a mess, absolute mess. Um, so the other portion of this is hail and lightning data, uh, which really only has data if we have hail or lightning. So there's some really light times of year, there's some really heavy times of year. Um, so that really wasn't very much of the concern. Um, but like I said, we had 176 input files for each of these for every six minutes of every single day. Um, so we would get over 70 megabytes per six minutes, um, usually uh, over 300,000 rows per six minutes. Um, so it's a lot of data. Uh, we were also having to deal with the SQL Server database, which I absolutely abhorred, but of course I couldn't change it. Um, uh, we have, we're running up against about 200 million rows at the moment. Um, some of this processing has decreased that, thankfully, uh, but we were also using Esri's native SQL, or spatial indexes, which don't really like being messed with either. Uh, so that's the problem. Uh, the poor design part of it, um, I'll talk about it a little bit. Uh, so the, the original script really looked like it was written um, by somebody who put all of this into ArcMap's uh, model builder and said, export me my Python script, and there I go. You know, <laughs> run this and run this and run this and run this, and there I'm good. Um, and of course, nobody would cop to having written this script in the first place. Um, but before I talk about the design, um, I'd like to talk about benchmarking, which almost nobody seems to ever talk about. Um, it's a very, very important thing when you're trying to optimize code. You want to know if something worked, and a lot of the things that I tried didn't work, and they were very obvious about them not working because they would take longer. Um, so timestamps are important. Logging everything is important. Um, having one log file per test run was very important because that allows you to just really easily compare, um, you know, pull them both up on the screen and go, oh, this one was faster. Um, and then running in the same environment is always important for benchmarking as well. Uh, so um, I.O. was actually the hugest bottleneck out of this entire uh, process, as you might have guessed. Um, so uh, in the original um, file, we had this, this big loop going on where it would process one file and then load the file and go to the next file and process that and load it and process it and load it. So you had this big, huge loop going on and everything was happening inside the loop. All of the declarations, all of the accessing data, all of the dumping the data, all that stuff. Um, unfortunately, it was also rebuilding the spatial index on this huge wind table every single time it put this little tiny six minute file in. Um, and it was also, having to, it was also uh, having to run through the database finding the next object ID every single time it did that as well. So this actually wound up being the most immense part of the time sink. Um, so uh, rewriting this process, process everything all at once, and then load everything. It it's kind of seems like kind of common sense, but people don't tend to think that way when they think of code. They think, what do I need to do? And then when do I need to do it? And it's, it just kind of, kind of cycles. Um, so the important thing here is that we're not b rebuilding the spatial index either. Um, there's a, a very, very small little bit of, uh, of ArcPy documentation that says if you're only touching a very sig insignificant part of your data sets, maybe like 5% or less, which we definitely were, then you don't want to do this. But unfortunately, this is turned on by default. 
Uh, so we told it to stop doing that. Um, so this is a little bit of the, the, um, the kind of power gain you can get from breaking up that loop and doing all of your, pre -pro doing all of your processing as pre-processing and then uh, doing a dump out of everything that's valid all at once. Um, data manipulation. This is another thing that, um, this is, this is the, the one thing that's kind of near and dear to my heart is I don't like having things spread out. Uh, so we had a, um, we had a date change happening in the database where it was hidden from the people who were going to be maintaining the script. Um, so that got pulled back in. Uh, we, were, we decided we were going to start using a, an intermediate database just simply because um, shapefiles, which were our base, uh, our base format, don't support time. Um, it's a dependency on, or it's a dependency that comes uh, from the DBF format you know, way back before I even started programming. Um, and grouping manipulations together also just makes it that much more maintainable. Uh, by bringing in an intermediate database and bringing the date changes into the program, we actually increased the time a little bit, but uh, we felt that that was a decent trade-off, and it really didn't increase it all that much. Um, filtering. Delete your garbage data first. <laughs> that was another thing that was absolutely first. Um, that was another thing that was, that was holding up the script quite a, get, quite, quite a bit, was it was doing all of this data in manipulation on bogus data, on uh, false data items coming back from NOAA, on uh, zero data, on data that was so small that they didn't really even want to look at it, but they were processing it all anyway. Um, and so we started deleting all of that first, uh, and that got us a little bit better of a gain. Um, and then we get to a, another optimization strategy of store what you're actually using, um, so that you're not, uh, you're not depending on your endpoint system to be translating time into a different format or um, uh, doing a, a point comparison with polygons, which is what they were doing, and it was taking, it was eating a lot of time on the front end. Um, and this actually wound up saving us a little bit of time uh, in the processing as well, because we wound up pushing fewer data rows uh, into SQL Server. Um, so that is basically it. Uh, the whole, I guess the whole point of, my whole conclusion was um, to, uh, I guess, take a st step back when you're writing code that works with large amounts of data and kind of uh, turn your code on its head every great once in a while and see if it's faster. It might be. Um, so that's pretty much it. Um, does anybody have any questions? Originally, this was one script that did everything, right? Yes. Did, as part of this process, did you find it uh, useful to maybe break out the uh, job into like, multiple scripts? That way, the time-consuming loading part that you have worked so hard to test you don't have to redo that every single time as you work on debugging the rest of it, or? Right, um, so the question is uh, whether or not I went through and, and modulized this as I, uh, as I went, and yes, I absolutely did. Um, it started getting uh, uh, a little bit ungang or un ungainly, so it was a pretty large script. It was several hundred lines of Python code, and to my programmer's head, that's too big. Um, so uh, I think it lives in six or seven files now, um, Two, two main loading scripts, and then a bunch of just common utility files sitting off to the side. Anybody else? Good. So you started at 26 hours, and right. So um, 26 hours was the full production was the time for the full production run um, for 24 hours of data. Um, the times that I have here are for uh, a single six hour or six minute chunk. Um, of that time. So uh, it was a much smaller data set. It was also running on a slower computer, which is why four hours doesn't really fit into that, that kind of a scale. Um, but comparative numbers are always much more important when you're looking at, um, uh, when you're looking at benchmarks than absolute numbers. So did the time go down? Um, by what factor did it go down? Not necessarily that um, uh, it took six hours less, something like that. Um, we did. Uh, ArcPy as a library doesn't particularly like <laughs> parallelization. Um, I am forcing it to do a little bit of that now on the second iteration of, of uh, making this beast a little faster. Um, but you have to be very careful about uh, what you attempt to parallelize, parallelize because it doesn't always release locks. Um, it doesn't always uh, like to give up um, its access to certain little bits of things and then it explodes. 